Longtime war correspondent Michael Yan is back. And Michael, we got a lot to talk about. Um, I want to start with Afghanistan. I mean, you are currently tracking migrants in Panama. So we're going to get to that in a second. But I want to talk about Afghanistan because that's what's all over the news right now. And it's a place you've been to many times. And before we started recording, you're like, it was so bad that I was like, I'm done. I'm done here. And I wanted to ask you about that. But Let's go real fast to the latest out of the White House. And uh, Biden has said that he's authorizing the deployment of 5,000 troops uh, to make sure, he says, quote, we can have an orderly and safe drawdown of U.S. personnel and other allied personnel and an orderly and safe evacuation of Afghans who helped our troops during our mission and those at special risk from the Taliban advance. Uh, Second, ordered our armed forces and intelligence community to ensure that we will maintain the capability and the vigilance to address future terrorist threats from Afghanistan. And third, I've directed the Secretary of State to support President Ghani and other Afghan leaders as they seek to prevent further bloodshed and pursue a political settlement. Um, And then also he's saying that they have told the Taliban representatives that any action on their part on the ground in Afghanistan that puts U.S. personnel or our mission at risk there will not be, or will be met with a swift and strong U.S. military response. Um, Then there's a couple other things, but I think, you know, he goes on to say, over our country's 20 years at war in Afghanistan, America has sent its finest young men and women, invested nearly $1 trillion, trained over 300,000 Afghan soldiers and police, equipped with state-of-the-art military equipment, maintained their air force as part of the longest war in history. Um, one more year or five more years of U.S. military presence would not have made a difference in the Afghan military, cannot or will not hold its own country, would not have made a difference if the Afghan military cannot or will not hold its own country. That's what he's saying. So just curious, what are your initial thoughts on, on that statement? Well, you know, I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. I was I started in Iraq and uh, and then took a break from Iraq in 2006, thinking I would go to Afghanistan to see the war that we quote unquote won. And uh, as soon as I hit the ground in Afghanistan, I realized we had not won the war. And I wrote 12 major dispatches in 2006 saying that we were losing the war. That's 2006. The mainstream did not catch up on that until 2009. I caught a lot of flack for that. But I had specific reasons for saying it. First of all, when I went in 2006, I was not with U.S. or British forces. I was running around out there alone with some friends. And uh, one of the, but I would go on bases, for instance, and I would ask, I had a lot of contacts in British and U.S. military, and I would ask their intelligence people, how is your human going? Your human intelligence, is it going up? Is it going down? And I ask everybody the same question. And they started passing around, oh, you, you ask Colonel so-and-so the same question. Yeah, I just want to know your trends. Are your human trends going up or are they going down? If they're going up, that's a very good sign. They were going down. Everybody, to a man, said they're going down, right? Uh, and that's a that's like your blood pressure is crashing, right? So actually, that's a, there's a case in point for any FBI or others who are watching this, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, if our human is going down in the United States, and like, for instance, people are not giving information to the FBI, that should tell you something. So likewise, when I went back to Iraq in 2006 and seven, our human started to skyrocket. And that's when I said we were starting to turn that war around, which we did, right? In Afghanistan, I could go on for hours. And by the way, when I left in 2011, I didn't leave because it was getting too dangerous. I went straight to other conflicts. I went straight to other com- combat. I left because I saw it as hopeless because nothing that we did, you know, I started in 2006 in, in Afghanistan. I left in 2011. I was going to the most dangerous places. For instance, Sangin was the most dangerous district in Afghanistan and uh, out of almost 400 districts. And when no, no journalist wanted to go out there. The British asked me if I would go. I went. Uh, heavy combat, constantly fighting. Look up Sangin. So it's not as if I was running from combat. That's not, I went straight to other, I just got out of the jungle here, actually setting up trip wires to see which people are coming, not trip, not literal trip wires, but uh, to see act, actually who is coming into the United States through Panama. I think we're gonna start seeing Afghans soon. We already see Pakistan, we see some Afghans here. We see some Pakistanis, we see lots of Bangladeshis. I see them all the time here um, and, and Indians and others. So what do I think about it? It was a foregone conclusion for years that this would be an end state at some point, but we we have left it in a catastrophic condition. We did not need to abandon it like this. The Soviets, you you talked about sending in 5,000 more troops. When the Soviets abandoned Afghanistan or retreated from Afghanistan, 
likewise they had to reinforce as well because the pashtun most of the taliban are pashtun right uh, and most of the afghan national army are not pashtun by the way that's just a few percentage uh, are pashtun in the afghan national army they're mostly tajik uzbek hazars right they're not they're not so in any case the bulk of the population in afghanistan is pashtun and they're not in the army mostly uh and so when the soviets left they had to reinforce because the pashtuns have a tendency to it's a cultural war tendency every culture has their own way of doing war pashtuns always pursue an, a, a fleeing enemy they always do if they can they're like a, they're like a you know a, a border collie if you run border collie chase you automatically if you run from pashtun they come right after you right and so that's what's happening now so they see you know we hear if if the taliban are talking about oh yeah we're not gonna we're gonna you know we're gonna hold this treaty for a short, certain amount of time no 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 that's not how they operate they operate on the talk 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 fight 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 just like the communists by the way talk 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 fight 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 they will not abide by any agreements uh, they're going to continue to attack uh u.s citizens have been left behind in afghanistan they're stuck there right now now i've gotten word this morning that the U american citizens from the u.s embassy are all out now that's the american citizens at the u.s embassy if that report is accurate and the source is quite good that does not mean americans are out of afghanistan i know for a fact that there are americans in afghanistan who are stuck right now because i'm helping to get some out it's it's a it's a serious problem because the Taliban will want to humiliate the United States. They'll want to, they, they're already beheading people, for instance, in Farah province. Um, a few days ago, Taliban took over um, Farah city, which is the uh, it's capital of Farah province, and, and told you know, people that used to work for the government to come in. Everything's finished. We're going to give you ID cards, and then you can go home. They did. They actually went in. This is according to a source who was there. They, they gave the ID cards. And then they beheaded uh, some of those people that night. I don't know if they beheaded them all, but they went to their homes and started chopping off heads. That's what they do. That's how they roll. And so it's, it, uh, I anticipate, and if you look at my track record starting in 2006, I'm batting very, very high uh, batting average on Afghanistan, uh, which made me extremely unpopular in 2006 uh, because I could see this coming. It was very clear. We were fighting the same war every year over and mm -hmm. over and over. We never evolved. The Afghans evolved in their fighting and their methods of fighting us. We did not evolve in any appreciable way. We got new gear. We got new helicopters. We got new MRAPs and that sort of thing. Uh, but you know, it was just a, another unit saying the last unit didn't know what they were doing. And then we do the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. Well, and I pulled up this Washington Post article at War With The Truth. I don't know if you remember this from 2019, so long after you were talking about it. And the subheaded is U.S. officials constantly said they were making progress. They were not, and they knew it, an exclusive post investigation found. And they'd write here, a confidential trove of government documents obtained by the Washington Post reveals that senior U.S. officials failed to tell the truth about the war in Afghanistan throughout the 18-year campaign, making rosy pronouncements they knew to be false and hiding unmistakable evidence the war had become unwinnable. So, um, you know, it, it, this is a long article. I won't read it all. And I'm sure a lot of people have already seen it. But, uh, you know, it, it does seem like I'm sure it's not new to, you know, U.S. history to talk about war one way when it's going down in reality another way. But as somebody who's actually you know, been through these conflicts. Uh, wh what do you think, uh, just curious, like what would you do in this situation if you were in charge? Because you hear different people, veterans like, you know, policymakers like Tulsi Gabbard has a very different opinion from somebody like Dan <clears throat> Crenshaw. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's hard, I think, for Americans to understand it. And, you know, a lot of people know my husband was a Marine. He, he was in, in, in Afghanistan multiple times. Um, the 10 year anniversary of one of his, uh, best friends dying second, you know, literally minutes, uh, after he was in Lynn's arms, um, shot in the face was, was just a couple days ago. And it's so hard for them to watch all of this, knowing the cost, you know, and knowing, um, what, they were sent to do and then just watching this and they, and they did watch similar things happen in Iraq. Um, you know, we, we come, we go, what, what are we doing there? And then we leave and then it's a mess. And 
I just think it's really hard for Americans, generally speaking, to understand like what the hell is going on. And then also for veterans specifically to watch it and and just think like of the the, the cost that that it, it has taken on them. You know, and then they come back here and they deal with all kinds of other issues. But but you just watch it. It just it's just such a mess and so hard to understand. Yeah, your husband was a Marine, so he was almost certainly in Helmut province, which is where Sangin. He may have been in Sangin, uh, where I was. That Helmut was where a huge part of the combat occurred. Uh, you know, that's why we send the Marines there. Um, and um, unrealistic expectations. Uh, that was what I was coming back with in 2006. You got to keep in mind who I am. I've spent more than half of my life outside of the United States. I've spent more than half my life in developing in third world countries and countries other than the United States. For instance, India for a year, Nepal for a year, to Afghanistan, to Iraq. Uh, Oh, Lord, just so many. I was just in Morocco. I was just in Greece and Bulgaria. I just got back from Lithuania. And now I just got out of the jungle in Panama. I'm with foreign cultures all the time. When I went to Afghanistan, I saw something that was um, almost Stone Age. Uh, The idea, unrealistic expectations, the idea that we're going to go in there and fix women's rights is ridiculous. You know, I was at the January 6th Capitol uh, attack. I I covered that. I was at the inauguration. We can't even defend Washington, D.C. We can't defend Atlanta. I was just down there with Antifa. I've been up in Portland, you know, covering BLM and Antifa, Portland, Watch August 21st and August 22nd. I highly expect there will be serious violence in Portland. We're talking about we can't defend the United States right now. We got a border. I'm down here in Panama. There's probably 20,000 people this month are going to come across the border just in Panama and more than 200,000 up across the, the U.S. border from Mexico. Right. We're not even defending our own borders. The idea that we're going to be able to change Afghanistan and bring women's rights is absolutely ridiculous. I had lunch a couple times with Barry McCaffrey, retired general. You often see him on NBC and that sort of thing. And Barry McCaffrey's saying, you know, well, you know, I thought it would take, you know, I, you know, he's been saying it would take 15 years, right? I said, Barry, it's not going to take 15 years. It's going to take 100, right? It'll t- Afghanistan is at minimum a 100-year project, period. If you're coming in here with a 15 year plan and people think that's aggressive, I mean, Americans wanted to be out of there in two to three, four, five years. And so when Barry McCaffrey said 15, that blew some people's minds. I came back from Afghanistan. I'm sitting at the table with him in Virginia or Washington, wherever we were. And, you know, it was just him and I, and, you know, we're, you know, talking about that. And, uh, you know, for instance, let's talk about Nepal, where I spent a year, right? Nepal is about, let's say, arguably 60 to 70 years ahead of Afghanistan. That was when they started to open up in the 1950s, right? Nepal started to open up. People started to come in. They have this, they have a very similar problem set with Afghanistan. Massive amounts of mountains and valleys. Almost everybody is illiterate. No bridges, no roads. And so they're not literate in any access language. For instance, the, in, in, uh, in, in Nepal, they spoke so many different languages, the same in Afghanistan. And the people who are literate in Afghanistan are typically literate in languages like uh, Pashtun. And they're not very literate in that. Or Uzbek, or Tajik, right? Hazar, if they're literate in those languages. They're not access languages like English, French, Spanish, Chinese, Russian, you know, no, German. No, they're not fluent in any access language whatsoever, right? And so the idea that we're going to come in there and change these countries around in 15, 20 years is absolutely unrealistic. And that was one of the most important factors that I saw was, was really setting us up for failure was this idea that we're going to come in there and very quickly change everything with force. Like, Oh, we went to the moon. We Americans, I I saw Apollo 11 lift off from the moon in Florida on our family boat at the time. Right. When I was five years old, and ever since that time, I'm like, we're Americans. We went to the moon. We can do everything, right? And then you go around and you see the world a little bit more, and you're like, mm, hold on. We can do a lot of things. We're incredible people. But let's be realistic. We can't do everything. We can't change countries like Afghanistan in, in 15 or 20 years. These things uh, are a very slow process. Let's talk about Afghanistan again. 80% of the population, just in Nepal, just as is Nepal, live outside of a few major cities. In Afghanistan, those would be Kabul, 
Mazari Sharif, which was just fell to the Taliban, by the way, uh, Jalalabad, uh, uh, for uh, there's a few major cities that Kandahar, of course, uh, but most of the people live in villages and most of those villages don't have any paved roads. They don't have electricity. They don't have, if they have electricity, it's a, it's a double a battery and a, and a clock that is on their mud, uh, home, uh, that tells them what time to pray. That's the only electricity they'll have, uh, other than sometimes they have, they'll have motorbikes and they'll charge their cell phones with those motorbikes. Right. That's about it. They have cell phones because, of course, we installed those. And uh, so they're, they're just, it will be generations before we even have enough bridges to connect these villages. One of the things you'll see in countries like Nepal or Afghanistan or countries with thousands of islands is that each of these little valleys or islands, they are islands, right? For instance, in Nepal, you can, or Afghanistan, same situation. This village here is only, you know, 500 yards from that village on the other side of the river, which has a school and a paved road that comes to it and even uh, other things, right? But this one, since there's no bridge, might as well be on Mars. It might as well be on a planet because you can't go through this ravine and get up over there. You need thousands of bridges to make this happen. Thousands literally building bridges and this takes a long time especially when you got taliban out there shooting people so you know the idea uh, it was it, our biggest problem was unrealistic expectations and that's where we're at now uh, that we were going to eventually see a moment like this well i've been saying it since 2006. Uh, others uh didn't see it coming it did not happen it did not have to happen like this we could have kept special operations forces there uh, but at the same time, I'm quite concerned about the United States when we've got more than 200,000. And I'm telling you, from what I'm doing now, I'm covering migration issues, right? We are about to get, if you think the flood into the United States is bad now, it's building. It's coming more. That's why I'm down here in Panama now. I'm watching what's coming through. It's increasing. Remember, when we talked a couple of months ago, I said it's increasing dramatically. It has now. It's, it's, it's about three times higher than it was when I left about six or seven weeks ago from Panama. And so I want to get to that, uh, if that's okay. And we'll show some of the video that you just shot, because it's another fascinating topic that you're seeing firsthand. Um, real fast, I just saw this. I was trying to find the video of Biden talking about, because people were asking, like, do you think the Afghan troops are going to be okay? And he's like, they have all this equipment. And, you know, it just, it seems like a mess. Um, Can I say but, something on that? Can I say something, yeah. Allison? Okay. Mm -hmm. a, an Afghan trait in war is they will surrender en masse and flop sides. That's what they do. They've done it for centuries and that's their trait. So the idea that the Afghan National Army is going to stand up and fight is unrealistic. He doesn't understand the the the, the terrain, the culture in that terrain. I mean, it's, it's just the cultural terrain. It's just not going to happen. They're gonna flip flop. They're not gonna. They're not gonna fight. They're gonna. They're gonna do what they always do. They're gonna break down into tribal entities and warlordism. That's what. That's what. And Taliban, of course, will be a major power broker. And then there'll be sub fights. As Taliban will fight Taliban. Taliban always fight Taliban. It's the normal fish in the aquarium fight. So check this out. This guy is Stefan Simonowitz, I guess is how you say his last name. But this is on Twitter. Photo one right here. Um, he's saying is U.S. diplomat evacuate U.S. from embassy via helicopter as the Taliban enter Kabul from all sides, Afghanistan 2021. Photo two right here. He's saying this is U.S. diplomat evacuate U.S. from embassy via helicopter as the PAVN and Viet Cong capture Saigon, Vietnam, 1975. It's a fascinating it. similarity. Yeah, they couldn't resist the helicopter thing, huh? Uh, I mean, you know, uh, uh, we had numerous problems here. One is we closed down Bagram Air Force Base or Bagram Air Base, right? Uh, not an Air Force Base, but an Air Base, right? And so we closed down that base, and uh, and that was a support base that we could have used to to until we if we were going to evacuate the way that we're doing now, we needed to keep enough combat power on the ground to do it. Again. The Soviets, when they began to retreat, they had to reinforce to get their troops out because Pashtun always pursue 
a retreating enemy. That's their habit. They're like border collies. And so that's what's going to happen now. Now they're going to go after every U.S. citizen, everybody who was involved in, in any even suspected to be involved. If your family was involved, they're going to start stacking up heads. That's what they do. And uh, they'll be one of the things that they'll do is they'll grab guys off the street. They'll grab their phone. They'll beat the hell out of them, get their password out of them, which will take all 30 seconds. People to say that torture don't work, don't know what they're talking about. They'll just beat you up and get your password. And then they're going to drop your pants, rape you, make video with your own phone and send it to your whole contact list. That's what they do. That's what they do all the time. They get your phone, make a video raping you and send it to your whole family and all your friends. And which then goes viral around Afghanistan. That's what they're going to be doing right now. Guaranteed. They've been doing it for years. If you like wine or coffee or both, here are two of my sponsors that help you support my work and have something great to drink while you watch my videos. The first is AllisonWinePromo.com. Allison with one L, WinePromo.com. You get 50% off some of my favorite Argentinian Malbecs and 50% off shipping. One of these bottles comes from the third highest vineyard in the world. They use no flavoring or dyes, no filtering, and no excess chemicals. Chemicals, but if coffee is more your beat, then check out twinenginecoffee.com slash Allison, twinenginecoffee.com slash Allison. These are all Nicaraguan coffees. They keep many of the jobs local because they grow, select, roast, and package in Nicaragua. They are USDA certified organic, shade grown, and high altitude. So again, twinenginecoffee.com slash Allison, allisonwinepromo.com. Have a great glass of coffee, a great glass of wine, and support free speech, whatever you're drinking.